Hey guys, welcome to Medifaction. Today, let's learn about diabetes mellitus. So, diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic disorders having features of hyperglycemia, which means increased blood glucose level. Normally, the blood glucose levels are maintained in a very narrow range of 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. We all know that the prevalence of diabetes is increasing sharply in the developing countries because of more sedentary lifestyle. So, the American Diabetes Association has formed various definitions. First one is euglycemic, which means individuals are considered to be euglycemic when the fasting glucose level is less than 100 mg per dl or glucose level less than 140 mg per deciliter following an OGTT. OGTT is nothing but oral glucose tolerance test. Next one is pre-diabetes, otherwise impaired glucose tolerance. It is defined as a condition in which there is impaired glucose tolerance but the elevated blood glucose does not reach the criterion accepted for an outright diagnosis of diabetes. The risks for prediabetes are progression to frank diabetes over time and also cardiovascular diseases. The third one is diabetes. Any one of the three criteria can be used for diagnosis of diabetes. First one is fasting glucose level greater than 126 mg per dl. Otherwise, a random plasma glucose greater than or equal to 200 mg per dl that is in a patient with classic hyperglycemic signs. And also a 2 hour plasma glucose greater than or equal to 200 mg per dl during an oral glucose tolerance test that is OGTT with a loading dose of 75 grams and a glycated hemoglobin HbA1c level greater than or equal to 6.5%. Classification. So broadly there are two types of diabetes which are type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. First let's see about type 1 diabetes. The type 1 diabetes accounts for approximately 5% to 10% of all cases. Most commonly these are occurring in childhood that is younger than 20 years of age. So what causes this? Autoimmune diseases which are characterized by pancreatic beta cell destruction and which leads to absolute insulin deficiency. So this right here is the pancreas and right here the pancreas islet cells are focused and you can see the beta cells right here and the beta cells are secreting insulin. So when the beta cells are decreased or destroyed there will be deficiency of insulin. The next cause is idiopathic, which is a rare form in which there is no evidence of autoimmunity. Pathogenesis. So, there will be the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes involves an interplay of both genetic susceptibility and environmental factors. Let's see one by one. What is genetic susceptibility? The incidence of type 1 diabetes is greater in twins of affected individuals than in the general population and greater in monozygotic than in dizygotic twins. Next we have the HLA genes otherwise human leukocyte antigen genes. In about 95% of patients with type 1 diabetes have either HLA-DR3 or HLA-DR4 genes or even both compared with the general population. Also we have the known HLA genes which includes polymorphism in gene coding insulin, CTLA4 and PTPN22 genes which are involved in immune tolerance and are associated with 
excessive T cell activation. There can be also polymorphism in the CD25. Now let's see the environmental factors. So we have the viral infections. They may trigger the islet cell destruction and associations have been found between type 1 diabetes and infection with mumps, rubella, coxsackie B or even cytomegalovirus. Three different mechanisms explain the role of viruses in induction of autoimmunity. First mechanism is release of hidden or sequestered antigens. So viral infections cause islet injury and inflammation, thereby release the sequestered beta cell antigens and it activates autoreactive T cells. The next mechanism is molecular mimicry. The viruses can produce proteins that mimic the beta cell antigens. The immune response produced against the viral protein may cross-react with the self tissue that is the beta cell antigens. Next is sharing of antigen epitopes. The first viral infections by a predisposing virus during early in life might persist in the beta cells. So subsequent reinfections with a related virus known as precipitating virus that shares antigen epitopes may lead to an immune response against the beta cells. Now let's see the mechanism of beta cell destruction. As I told earlier, the genetic susceptibility and environmental factors leads to the beta cell destruction and finally the absolute deficiency of insulin. So the autoimmune damage starts many years before the disease becomes clinically evident. Hyperglycemia and ketosis occur after more than 90% of beta cells have been destroyed. So there are various mechanisms. First one is failure of self-tolerance in T cells. It is the basic abnormality in type 1 diabetes. What causes this? Failure of self-tolerance may be due to combination of defective clonal deletion of self-reactive T cells in the thymus or defects in the function of regulatory T cells. Otherwise, resistance of affected T cells into the suppression by regulatory cells and also cytokines. The Th1 cells may destroy the beta cells by secreting cytokines including interferon gamma and tumor necrosis factor. Also, there may be direct killing. How? The CD8 plus T cells may directly kill the beta cells. Next, we have the autoantibodies. So, these autoantibodies against beta cell antigens. They are found in 70 to 80 percentage of patients with type 1 diabetes. And these are generally asymptomatic. Now, let's move on to the type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, the type 2 diabetes is a multifactorial disease caused by insulin resistance and dysfunction of beta cells leading to relative deficiency of insulin. And these accounts for approximately 90-95% to 95 of diabetic patients. Now let's see the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes mellitus. As I told earlier, there is genetic factors and environmental factors. The environmental factors play a role and includes sedentary lifestyles, dietary habits and associated obesity particularly central or visceral obesity. And next we have genetic factors. The type 2 diabetes has a concordance rate of 35 to 60 percentage in monozygotic twins compared with 17 to 30 percentage in dizygotic twins. So lifetime risk of type 2 diabetes in an offspring is more than double if both parents are affected. Next we have the diabetogenic genes. They have also been found and there is no evidence of an autoimmune basis for this. So this leads to metabolic defects 
in type 2 diabetes. So this causes two important metabolic defects which are the insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. First, let's see about the insulin resistance. The insulin resistance is the decrease or failure of target tissues, that is the peripheral tissues, to insulin action. The main factors in the development of insulin resistance is obesity. So obesity is associated with type 2 diabetes and the visceral obesity is found in more than 80% of patients. Amount of fat. As we all know that insulin resistance is found even in simple obesity without hyperglycemia. The risk for diabetes increases as the body mass index increases. Cause of insulin resistance in obesity. It is induced by non-esterified free fatty acids, adipokines, chronic inflammation in adipose tissue and even activation of PPAR or even excess of free fatty acids, there is inverse correlation between fasting plasmas and insulin sensitivity. The obese individuals have excess circulating free fatty acids that gets deposited as triglycerides in the muscles and liver tissues results in markedly increasing level of intracellular triglycerides. The central adipose tissue is more lipolytic than peripheral sites and central obesity is associated with insulin resistance. Next we have adipokines. The adipose tissues acts as a functional endocrine organ. It secretes variety of proteins into the systemic circulation which are termed as adipokines or adipose cytokines. The adipokines can be divided into pro-hyperglycemic adipokines for example resistin, retinol binding protein 4 and also anti-hyperglycemic adipokines such as leptin and adiponectin which improves insulin sensitivity. Now let's move on to the beta cell dysfunction. In type 2 diabetes the beta cell dysfunction manifests as inadequate insulin secretion by the pancreatic beta cells in association with insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. The beta cell dysfunction is multifactorial in origin. Now let's try to connect between obesity and beta cell dysfunction. The pancreatic beta cells initially respond to long-term demands of peripheral insulin resistance by undergoing compensatory hyperplasia leading to increased insulin secretion that is hypersecretion. Thus, the insulin secretion is initially higher for each level of glucose than in controls. This hyperinsulinemic state can compensate for peripheral resistance and maintain normal blood glucose for years. Beta cell failure that is early stage. However, at some point the beta cells exhaust their capacity to adapt. Therefore, the beta cell compensation cannot maintain normal blood glucose level. This stage the patient develop impaired glucose tolerance. Next is the late stage, otherwise the beta cell failure stage. In this stage, the early stage of beta cell failure is followed by decreased insulin secretion and hyperglycemia and frank diabetes develops. Molecular mechanisms of beta cell dysfunction, excess free fatty acids and decreased insulin signaling will re result into this. Next is lipotoxicity. It may be responsible for both insulin resistance and beta cell failure. Next we have chronic hyperglycemia, otherwise glucotoxicity, an abnormal that is incretin effect with the reduced secretion of hormones that promote insulin release. Also we have direct toxicity by amyloid deposits in long-standing type 2 diabetes in which the amyloid deposits in islets 
is seen in more than 90% of cases. The islet amyloid protein may be directly cytotoxic to islets causing beta cell dysfunction. So, as we can see here, the beta cell dysfunction will lead to normal glycemia. That is, there won't be much change. But when the stage becomes the early stage, there will be beta cell failure which results in impaired glucose tolerance and during the late stage that is complete beta cell failure there will be diabetes. Now let's see the complications of diabetes. First one is hyperglycemia. Control of blood sugar level that is glycemic control can reduce the long term complications of diabetes. The glycemic control is assessed by estimation of glycosylated hemoglobins that is HbA1c. The HbA1c is formed by addition of glucose to hemoglobin in red blood cells. The HbA1c should be maintained below 7% in diabetic patients and its measurement is helpful in knowing the glycemic control over the lifespan of red blood cells which is 120 days. The other complication is organ damage by hyperglycemia. The chronic hyperglycemia and the metabolic disorders cause secondary damage in multiple organ systems. Common organs damaged are kidneys, eyes, nerves and blood vessels. Now let's see the morphology. First of all, let's see the morphology of pancreas. Lesions of pancreas are not diagnostic and are more common with type 1 than with type 2 diabetes. The morphological changes include reduced number and size of islet cells. It is seen in type 1 diabetes which is mild in type 2 diabetes. Next we can appreciate infiltration of islets also known as insulitis mainly by T lymphocytes predominantly in type 1 diabetes. We also have amyloid deposition within islets. I just have mentioned it in the earlier slides. It is observed in and around capillaries between cells in type 2 diabetes. In advanced stages the islets may be virtually obliterated and may show fibrosis. Increase in number and size of islets. It may be seen in non-diabetic newborns of diabetic mothers as hyperplastic in response to the maternal hyperglycemia. Blood vessels Hyaline arteriosclerosis It can be found in hypertension. Elderly non-diabetics without hypertension and more severe degree in diabetics also. In diabetics, it is related to duration of diabetes and the level of blood pressure. It is characterized by amorphous hyaline thickening of the cell wall of the arterioles which may narrow the lumen of the blood vessel. Next is diabetic microangiopathy. It is characterized by diffuse thickening of the basement membranes which is mostly seen in the capillaries of the skin, skeletal muscle, retina, renal glomeruli and also renal medulla. Though capillaries show basement membrane thickening, they are leakier to plasma proteins than normal. The microangiopathy results in diabetic nephropathy retinopathy and some forms of neuropathy also. So this right here is a picture of hyaline arteriosclerosis. We can clearly appreciate it. Now let's see the clinical features of diabetes. Firstly, let's see the type 1 diabetes mellitus. So the type 1 diabetes can occur at any age. The classical Triad of diabetes is it consists of polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia, and in severe cases, ketoacidosis, 
which are due to metabolic derangements. Insulin requirement. In the initial one or two years, the exogenous insulin required may be minimal because of endogenous insulin secretion and later, its requirement suddenly increases because of decreased insulin production by the body. Now let's see the consequence of insulin deficiency. What does it lead in carbohydrate metabolism? In carbohydrate metabolism, there will be diminished transport of glucose into muscle cells and adipose tissue. There will be reduction of stored glycogen in liver and muscle due to glycogenolysis and this further aggravates the hyperglycemia. When hyperglycemia exceeds the renal threshold level, it develops glycosuria and leads to osmotic diuresis which then increased quantity of urine known as polyuria with loss of water and electrolytes. The water loss through urine plus hyperosmolarity due to hyperglycemia. This causes depletion of intracellular water which stimulates the osmoreceptors of the thirst centers of the brain and results in increased thirst known as polydipsia. Now, let's see the effect in protein and fat metabolism. The insulin deficiency causes catabolism of proteins and fats, which produces a negative energy balance and leads to increased appetite, known as polyphagia. In spite of increased appetite, catabolic effects of insulin results in paradoxical loss of weight and muscle weakness. The next complication is diabetic ketoacidosis. This is a serious complication of diabetes, more common and marked in type 1 diabetes, but also may occur in type 2 diabetes. Mechanism Diuresis and Dehydration Marked insulin deficiency plus associated epinephrine release and stimulates the secretion of glucagon, which leads to decreased peripheral utilization of glucose and increased gluconeogenesis and causes severe hyperglycemia that is the blood glucose levels will be ranging up to 500 to 700 mg per dl also osmotic diuresis and dehydration characteristic feature of ketoacidosis is osmotic diuresis and dehydration now let's see the difference between type 1 diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes mellitus. As I have mentioned earlier, age of onset. For type 1 diabetes, it is childhood and adolescence, whereas for type 2 diabetes mellitus, it is seen in adult, also seen in childhood and adolescence, rarely. Weight. The weight will be normal or present with weight loss in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus. But for type 2 diabetes mellitus, majorly people will be obese. Insulin levels. There will be progressive decrease, obviously. Whereas for type 2 diabetes mellitus, there will be increased insulin production in the early stage, whereas normal to moderate decrease in the late stage. Circulating islet Autoantibodies. In type 1 diabetes mellitus, it will be detected, but in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus, there won't be any circulating islet anti autoantibodies. Diabetic ketoacidosis. As I have mentioned earlier, for type 1 diabetes mellitus, there develops diabetic ketoacidosis in absence of insulin therapy. Genetics. HLA association. In type 1 diabetes mellitus, there is major linking of MHC that is major histocompatibility complex class 1 and 2 genes and there will be HLA DR3 and HLA DR4. But in case of type 2 diabetes, there is no HLA association. Non-HLA genes. As I have mentioned earlier, there will be polymorphisms in CTLA4 and PTPN22 in case of type 1 diabetes. 
whereas in type 2 diabetes mellitus there is diabetogenic and obesity related genes Ethiopathogenesis mode of development type 1 diabetes mellitus is autoimmune whereas type 2 diabetes mellitus is multifactorial mechanism for type 1 diabetes there will be breakdown in self tolerance to islet auto antigens in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus there is insulin resistance in peripheral tissues and beta cell dysfunction morphology first of all insulitis in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus the inflammatory infiltrate of T cells and macrophages in hyalates can be appreciated. Whereas in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus, there won't be any insulitis. Amyloid deposition in islets. Beta cell depletion. For type 1 diabetes mellitus, there is moderate to severe beta cell depletion. Whereas in type 2 diabetes, there is only mild beta cell depletion. So right here we can see the chronic vascular complications. So we can appreciate different organs being involved. So let's see one by one. First of all ocular that is isolated. There will be retinopathy, cataract and even glaucoma. Whereas when we check the CNS there may be cerebral infract cerebral hemorrhage moving on to cvs for chronic vascular complication there will be myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis in people having diabetes mellitus chronically because diabetes is one of the major modifiable risk disease for atherosclerosis and other cardiovascular morbidities the atherosclerosis is more severe and occurs at the early stage Diabetes have increased levels of plasminogen activity inhibitor that is PAI1 which inhibits fibrinolysis and favors development of atherosclerotic plaques. Now let's move on to in foot. In foot it may result in a condition known as diabetic foot which causes gangrene. Next is uh, peripheral neuropathy can be seen. Renal system. The renal arteries can also produce severe atherosclerosis. So when the renal systems are involved, it may lead to nephropathy, glomerulosclerosis, pyelonephritis and also atherosclerosis. So when looking generally, the acute metabolic complications are diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, lactic acidosis and hypoglycemia. Whereas chronic non-vascular complications include gastroparesis, infections, skin changes and even hearing loss. Hope you have understood the video. Like, subscribe and press the bell button for more videos. Thank you. Thanks for watching.